walking through this exhibition, there is always an overriding thing that catches you. Everyone talks about a digital revolution and how dentistry is revolutionized by this digital tool or that digital application. To be honest, I'm old enough to have heard of many, many digital revolutions since uh, the first time. And uh, to give you an idea, this is my first computer. I got this computer in 1989. It had one kilobyte memory. Today, one kilobyte is not enough to write your name on a Word document, but back then we could do a lot of things. And ever since I was hearing about a digital revolution almost on a monthly basis. And there was one part uh, that I actually got quite interested in. At some point later on, 2004, we even wrote a book about the digital dental clinic in Sweden with some of my colleagues there. Now, if you find this book anywhere, just don't buy it, please. Don't read it. It will be embarrassing to see how many things have changed since we envisioned a digital clinic in 2004. So the revolutions are coming one after the other, but there is also a pattern that I want to share with you. Once upon a time, I used to enjoy my music with these LP records. I would go to the store, I would browse through the shelves and pick the record, buy it, take it home and listen in my record player. Then suddenly there came a digital revolution in the sound. And the guy that you see here promised to revolutionize music by introducing the digital music, the digital compact disc. And I was among the first ones to jump on the wagon and say, yes, let's sell the LP and buy a CD player. And what did I do? I found myself doing the same thing. I was waking up in the morning, going to the record store, browsing the shelves, buying the CD and bring it home to listen. So essentially the technology evolved, but I caught myself doing the same thing when I wanted to enjoy music until someone envisioned music differently. Another guy who was not directly from the music industry decided that music should not be a product that you buy from a shelf. It could be something that lives in the cloud and you can get from the cloud wherever you are, however you like. And then he actually created a true revolution by introducing a digital product, which was based on the previous platforms. And this is when things started to happen. Things started to accelerate. Someone else came and made a platform for sharing music, which was quickly killed, but not before it gave birth to the concepts of more legal applications for enjoying music in the same way. And after that, it exponentially grew to funny directions. Then you could actually have a, a computer program to listen to music and tell you what the music is. You could have voice activation commands using your own voice to talk to the machine. And all this happened because of the digitization. So I think there is a very important pattern. And the pattern is that technology evolution technology that changes tools might not always revolutionize until we change our paradigm. The true revolution is not when the new tools come in play, but when our mindset changes and we see in these tools potential to do things we never could do before. And this is what the paradigm shift is all about. And I think that's what will really bring the true revolution. And this is what we're looking for also in dentistry. In dentistry, currently, we introduced a lot of new tools to do all tasks. We can make impressions with a new digital tool. We can make models with a new digital tool. We can actually mill and 3D print crowns. But is this enough to revolutionize our practice in implant dentistry? Just using a new tool to do the old task. What is the true revolution that we are having at our doorsteps. And here we need to look a little bit at the paradigms. Paradigm is the mindset, how we look into something. What was the paradigm in implant dentistry? Well, to see the original paradigm, I think I would go back to the first published textbook. This was a textbook that Bronemark used to summarize his whole protocols for the first time at uh, the end of 70s. And there you can read some amazing thoughts. What really 
amazed me is the title. Look at the title. It's tissue integrated prosthesis. Tissue integrated. Very ahead of that time. Why? Because in the decades that followed, what took over and dominated implant dentistry was not the title, was the subtitle, also integration. So for decades, also integration became the focus of implant dentistry, became the paradigm that everything was depending on. That place an implant in a way that also integrates the best possible also integration and the rest will follow. Someone, someone will come and use it in order to support teeth. But how far are we today from this paradigm to think that an implant is just wound healing in the presence of a foreign body? What is an implant today? What do you promise to give to your patients when you tell them that we are going to have an implant treatment? And here, I think we need a new paradigm. And paradigms sometimes come from science, sometimes come from science fiction. These are some science fiction characters. To the uh, left of the screen, you see the Hollywood cyborgs, very macho. They shoot a lot, they talk little. To the right of the screen is the Japanese ones. Still man-machine systems, but these are more complicated personalities, my favorite ones. Now, what is a cyborg? According to science fiction, is a man-machine complex. You might be surprised, this is not a science fiction concept. It's actually originating from science. And it comes from a scientific publication, which was published in the 60s. These are two astrophysicists from NASA, and they publish a paper where they envision that humans in the future are going to enhance their bodies with mechanical parts in order to adapt to the environment that they are facing. And they came with this beautiful definition of what is a cyborg. A man-machine system that incorporates exogenous components functioning as an integrated self-regulated homeostatic system fully adapted to the environment. Could you find a better definition of what implant treatment is today? Because I think this is exactly what I want to create. And because today we have all these digital tools for the first time, we can design not just a screw in the bone, but a whole system integrated with the tissues and the bacteria and functioning as a system, as a homeostatic construction. So we can today, using our tools, acquire data from the patient with all three-dimensional detail. We can then plan on every three-dimensional detail, every piece from the crown to the transmucosal and the implant part. And we can, of course, prefabricate all the components we need from the prosthetic components, also the implant components and everything in between. We can place the implant in the pre-planned position with computer assisted implant surgery, and we can also restore it with immediate prefabricated components. So for the first time, we have the ability to envision the whole process as one system. And I think this gives us an amazing potential to do things that we couldn't do ever before with dental implants starting from anterior immediate implants, full arch immediacy, and even posterior immediates that you see more and more being documented today. Using the digital workflow, we can design, we can envision, and we can execute to the very last detail as we want it. And I think that opens up now the responsibility we have to design properly. Because now you can really design and you can envision, but that means you should know how to design. You should know the principles that fill this critical space and what will join the implant platform to your crown in the mouth in the most optimal way. And that will be the focus I will have in the next few minutes. I will try to summarize what we know so far about the critical principles to design this amazing space. And I say amazing because I do believe that this space is one of the most unique ecosystems in the body. So I will focus on the peri-implant inflammations, mucositis and peri-implantitis, and I will try to see what do we know about reducing the risks through our optimization of the design. Now, to do that, 
I need to do a few things. I need to, first of all, discuss with you what is this transmucosal part. We have so many names for it. We call it emergence profile, transmucosal component, mucosal tunnel has been also heard. So how can we define it and speak with the same language? Second, I want to find the arguments that this design links to health and disease. Why our design matters? What is the connection there? And finally, I will try to speculate a little bit and hypothesize what is the optimal design that we can follow in order to secure the best possible outcomes. Now, with that, I need to make a little bit of a disclaimer. You see, periodontal tissues and peri-implant tissues have a lot of similarities and a lot of differences. And from the anatomical side, we can really pinpoint a lot of things. I want to go back to the very beginning. Periodontal tissue are physiological. They exist because they serve a purpose and they have evolved through millions of years of evolution to serve this purpose very well. Peri-implant tissue is not physiological. It doesn't exist normally anywhere in your body. It's a tissue that your body creates in response to a trauma and the placement of a mechanical component. So you cannot envision this tissue without understanding what caused it. And we have to study the implant and the prosthesis together with the soft tissues to understand the whole story. Peri-implant tissue and prosthesis is actually the two sides of the same coin. You can't have one without the other. So some time ago, Sorry for the jumping, my clicker is way too excited sometimes and keeps on embarrassing me. It's funny when you talk about technology and then it's technology that really embarrasses you. So some time ago with an international team of like-minded people, starting from clinical observations, we decided to come together to define a little bit this space as clearly as possible. And we used the term implant supracrestal complex in order to discuss and describe what happens into this critical zone where the different mechanical components, the different tissue of the body, the bacteria and the anatomic structures, they all work together as a system, a system that can work with us for health or against us in terms of disease. And uh, by the way, I have to also notice that uh, right now, the, in this very room, we have 50% of the authors of this paper. As uh, Dr. Vergulis from Greece is also here, and he is going to have a presentation in the afternoon. So I'm going to give you half the story this morning. For the other half, you will have to attend the afternoon presentation. A testimony to how Global Hub Singapore has become in dentistry. So let us look a little bit uh, the structures before we go into the details so we can speak the same language. I like to envision this supracrestal complex as one system, as a cohabitation, as a building where many different families live together. And on the ground floor, we have the osseointegration, integration where we have the bone, but of course we also have the implant in close proximity. And then we have the abutment and the abutment screw and all this in a configuration, which is called connection. And the interesting part is that something that goes wrong in one part of the system might manifest in another. So a problem in the connection can be noticed as a bone loss, for example. So the interrelation is really advanced. Now, first floor, we have the connective tissue area adhesion of connective tissue on the abutment, not attachment, like a light, tight contact. And on top of that, third floor is the junctional epithelium. Critical point, because this is really the ground zero. This is the true barrier that defines the inside of the body from the outside environment. And very critical where exactly it will be, but also where it will be in relation to the prosthetic components, as we will see. Then we also have the penthouse. And in the penthouse is the sulcus. Sulcus is a slot, is a small space which actually belongs to the oral environment, which communicates very tightly with whatever happens in the mouth and brings the oral ecosystem in contact with the deeper tissues. 
And of course, there is a prosthesis on top of that, which is like the roof. And this is where the biofilm lives and accumulates and interacts with everything in between. So this structure is also having mechanical side. And in the mechanical side, we have also channels, we have junctions, we have a lot of complex structures that you can't really ignore if you want to describe the soft tissues. Sometimes we have guest stars. We have guests that might show up like, uh, for example, bio components from uh, bio augmentations, bio material or cements that might interact with the whole thing. And what is the magic of this building is a true cohabitation. All the tenants of all the floors, they interact with each other and they can have a good cohabitation where everyone is a good neighbor or they can have troublesome cohabitation. You can have maybe a very loud neighbor on the penthouse doing a lot of loud parties and then, then the one that will suffer might be actually the one on the level below, the junctional epithelium. And then problem starts and police comes. And do we see problems with implants? Yes, of course, we see a lot of complications in the longer term. What are the main complications that we see? Let me summarize a few of the most common complications. We can have, of course, inflammation like mucositis, very frequent, or peri-implantitis, less frequently. We can have some marginal bone loss, which you might or might not consider a complication. It's a debatable question. Some people think that losing bone without inflammation might be a problem, and they believe that there should be a zero bone loss approach. Some people see that there is no real problem with that, and remodeling is natural and acceptable. But I note it there. Also, there could be aesthetic problems like recession or dehiscences and fenestrations, and that only on the biological side. On the technical side now, we also have a lot of problems like screw loosening, screw fractures, abutment fractures, or implant fractures on the collar. And even with some newer studies, even some veneer complications can be traced down to this part. What is now the most common thing that all these have together? They all start from the same location. They are all located somewhere between the bone margin and the mucosal margin in this implant supracrestal complex. So most of the complications we see today originate from this side. So understanding this could be the key to prevent a big number of complications, this cohabitation. You know, cohabitation today is also a major concept about health and disease when it comes to chronic inflammation. In the past, 200 years ago, Pasteur discovered bacteria. And his paradigm, which dominated medical care for centuries, was presence of bacteria causes disease, absence of bacteria is health. Today, we know this is not the case. Today, we know bacteria are there to stay, and they're very important for maintaining our health. So we can't do without bacteria. We need them, and they need us. It's a symbiosis. We just have to make sure that this cohabitation with the bacteria doesn't go bad that we become good neighbors and we don't lose the balance. So I believe that we are dealing with really very complex interactions we only now start to understand. The complexity of the bacterial interrelations and interactions is such that it's no longer about presence and absence, about killing bacteria. It's more about designing an ecosystem where nobody really dominates towards the dysbiotic condition. But that will be something I would maybe discuss in another time. I want to focus now on a different parameter. So